Good morning. Uh, good morning and thank you uh, for joining us this morning to discuss California's fentanyl epidemic and the work that we are doing at the local and state level to combat this crisis. I am Assemblywoman Kadi Petrie Norris and I am pleased to be joined today by law enforcement, by our local public officials and community leaders. Uh, including Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer, Commander Virgil Ascension from the Orange County Sheriff's Department, Orange County Supervisor Katrina Foley, Chief Michael Kent from the Irvine Police Department, Chief Ron Lawrence from the Costa Mesa Police Department, Mayor John Stevens from the City of Costa Mesa, Aubrey Ronquillo from the Alexander Neville Foundation, and Carol Green, the President of California State PTA. And I want to thank everyone who is here today for your partnership and your leadership on this critical, critical crisis. As we've all come to learn, fentanyl is one of the most dangerous and deadly substances in the world. Just two milligrams, that's two grains of sand, is enough to kill. And kill it certainly has. Over the last six years, the number of fentanyl-related deaths in California has skyrocketed from 239 in 2016 to 5,722 in 2021. That is an increase of more than 2,000%. And, and to put that a different way, that means that today and every single day, more than 15 Californians will die because of fentanyl poisoning. More than 15 people. And let's remember, these are not just numbers and statistics. These are our loved ones. They're our moms and our dads, our brothers and our sisters. They're community leaders, teachers, coaches, mentors. And they are our kids and our grandkids. In the state capitol, my colleagues and I are working to confront this crisis. Uh, this session, we have introduced legislation to combat the sale of fentanyl on social media, to help law enforcement prosecute fentanyl traffickers and hold them accountable for fentanyl murders, to increase penalties for traffickers, and to improve education about this deadly drug, and to ensure that Narcan this life-saving, life-saving medication is widely available and that everyone, everyone across the state of California knows how to use it. On my part, uh, I am focused this session on legislation to combat the sale of fentanyl online. And um, two really disturbing trends have prompted me to focus on this. The first is the proliferation of counterfeit pills. So increasingly, we are seeing people and kids, kids who are dying because of fentanyl overdose when they have taken something that they thought was a prescription drug. So they thought it was a Xanax, a Percocet, an Oxycodone, when in reality, they are being sold something that is laced with fentanyl. And second, alongside that trend, we are seeing drug traffickers abusing social media platforms to sell to our kids. The reality is that dealers don't need to lurk in dark street corners or remote parking lots. Now they are connecting with our kids on platforms like Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp. And I'll tell you, as a mom, this scares the hell out of me. And as a legislator, I am determined. I am determined to act so that we can do something about it and that we do more to keep our kids and communities safe. Uh, in this session, I have introduced two bills to help keep our, our kids safe online. Uh, the first is AB 1027 uh, to help law enforcement investigate fentanyl deaths on social media platforms. Uh, we are working with social media companies to ensure that they retain information and that that, law enforcement, that that information is available and accessible to law enforcement 
when they are conducting in investigations about fentanyl deaths that have occurred because of sales online. Uh, I've also introduced AB 955 uh, to strengthen penalties for online dealers and traffickers who are targeting and selling to our kids on these online platforms. Uh, this week, my bills were heard in two committees, uh, and I will tell you I'm not, I'll tell you I'm disappointed by the outcome of those hearings. Uh, while those bills have continued to advance and move forward, uh, they have been, in one case, uh, watered down significantly and in another uh, held for further study. Uh, so that's the bad news. But uh, the good news is that I remain committed alongside a huge number of my colleagues to continuing to push for action this session and to continue to push alongside, alongside for the, uh, the need for increased investments in rehabilitation, education, treatment for users and addicts who need help, to continue to push for stronger penalties for the traffickers and the dealers who are selling to our children and killing our kids. Uh, and so that is why I am, I'm pleased to be here and joined by so many leaders who are working alongside me in this fight. And uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce someone who really has been a leader in fighting to keep our kids and community safe. Uh, pleased to welcome District Attorney Todd Spitzer. Thank you. This is Alex, and this is Crime Victims Week in our entire country. And what happened in the legislature, and I'm, I'm a member of that club, having served there for six years, but I'm no longer there, so I probably have a little more liberty uh, than our good assemblywoman, uh, who still has to work there and work with her colleagues. And she's very, very brave, quite frankly, to come here today and actually talk about this. Because it's shameful that during Crime Victims Week in our entire country, California has specifically let down our crime victims. This is not a war on drugs. This is a war on murder. We talked about Alex Neville during our Crime Victims event on Monday. Supervisor Foley was there and many others who are standing here. He was a recreational drug user. And he got bad drugs, and at 14 years old, he died. His mother, who you all know, and she's been very, very verbal and was in Sacramento testifying with Matt Caparuto, who lost his daughter, they've been very clear about the needs to fight fentanyl. And the assemblywoman was very clear, and we are all very clear. There's an education component Every single teacher in California should have Narcon in their classroom, and they don't. Every single teacher should be trained on how to administer Narcon, and they aren't. Every school district and school board should adopt resolutions to have Narcon in our schools, and they haven't. We completely believe in education. But education and enforcement can coexist. They're not mutually exclusive. We are not dealing with people here who are good model citizens. We are talking about drug dealers. We are talking about people who know they are pushing fentanyl into our streets. We now know how it's getting here. We know where it's manufactured. And our kids and our entire population is completely in danger. I sat on that public safety committee when I was in the state legislature. And I can tell you unequivocally, its name is completely inappropriate. It is not the Public Safety Committee. It is the Pro-Criminal Committee. It supports initiatives to open our prison doors, to not hold people accountable, to shut prisons, which is on the agenda of our state legislature and other policymakers in Sacramento. And it's completely inappropriate solution to try to deal with the Alex's that are dying every single day. I am completely disheartened by 
how our assemblywoman was treated yesterday in committee as a member of that body, but I'm not surprised. And I want to make this very, very important point to all of you. You are the last resort as the members of the media. You're the last resort to explain this pandemic in California and the nation. You're the ones that have to explain 100,000 people have died. You're the ones that have to let the public know how serious this is. Because you have a well-respected, intelligent leader in our assemblywoman, and yet it's falling on deaf ears. Senator Umberg had the admonishment bill, SB 44. He's the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He was a, a, a drug czar under Bill Clinton in our nation's capital. He, he's, an, he's a leader in the military. He's one of the most respected members of the state legislature and one of the most well-experienced and educated. And his bill in the Senate Public Safety Committee was dead on arrival, just like these kids. And why? Because it has nothing to do with fentanyl. It has nothing to do with increased penalties. It has nothing to do with enhancements. It is a policy that started 20 years ago when I sat on the Assembly Public Safety Committee. The chairs of that committee, in order to become a chair of the Public Safety Committee, you have to commit to the President Pro Tem in the Senate or the Speaker in the Assembly that you will not let one bill out of that committee that either creates a new punishment, like the Assemblywoman's enhancement for those who peddle fentanyl, or new, new enhancements, more time, or any enhancement. They are, they are not allowed to get through those committees. And let me make something very clear. We all know what the definition of insanity is. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So 20 years ago, they said, if we stop prosecuting people and holding them accountable, we will be safer. And 20 years later, we are no safer. In fact, we're less safe than we were 20 years ago when we stopped incarcerating people. Perla Mendoza said it very, very well Monday. She said it again. She was quoted, she's been quoted from many of you. She said, we're either going to increase our populations of our prisons or we're going to increase the population of our morgues. That is the saddest state that I can imagine coming from a parent who lost their son. If we are not connected together by the untimely and, and, and unforeseen deaths of our young people, then I don't know what should be driving us as a community. And I must say, this is not an overdose. Please, when you do your stories, make sure the public understands these are not people who deserve to die because they were buying street drugs. They died because, yes, they bought an illicit, illegal street drug. But they had no idea that it was going to contain fentanyl. And as a result, they were killed. In Orange County, we're the safest large county in California because of the fine representation of people standing here, Supervisor Foley, Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris, and so many others, right, the leaders in law enforcement. We are going to do everything we can to make sure, irrespective of the legislature, we keep Orange County safe. And I think you know, I have designated a full-time prosecutor to prosecute fentanyl deaths as a cross-designated U.S. attorney. The taxpayers of Orange County are paying through the county for a full-time prosecutor to work in the United States Attorney's Office because when you sell a drug that contains fentanyl and somebody dies as a result of that, it's 20 years to life, mandatory minimum, no questions asked. I will not accept that there will be no solutions from the California legislature, and that's why I've done this workaround to go to the federal government, and we're, it's been met with great success. I'm so sad to be here today, so sad. Supervisor Foley and I were together at the Crime Victims event on Monday, and I am so sad. We shouldn't have to be working this hard. We shouldn't have to be making these arguments. We shouldn't have to parade out parents who have lost their children to cry in front of committees. That's pathetic. And yet we have to do it because we're falling on, and it's falling on deaf ears.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, DA Spitzer. Um, and uh, with that, uh, pleased to welcome Commander Virgil Ascension, who is joining us from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Good morning. On behalf of Sheriff Don Barnes, I want to thank Assemblywoman Petrie Norris for her legislation to address the fentanyl crisis. As our sheriff often says, the fentanyl crisis is one of the most significant health and safety issues facing our nation. In Orange County, we've seen fentanyl-related deaths increase from 37 in 2016 to 717 in 2021. In 2021, it was the leading cause of death for cases investigated by our coroner for those 17 years old and under. The rapid influx of this drug into our communities is very real and is illustrated by the year-to-year -year increase. In 2021, Orange County Sheriff's Department investigators seized 132.9 pounds of fentanyl, which equates to approximately 30 million lethal doses and 16,278 pills. In 2022, this increased to 449.9 pounds of fentanyl and 405,283 pills suspected of containing fentanyl seized. Solving this crisis requires a strategy of multiple components. We must focus on the demand of the drug by educating our youth and providing treatment for those who are addicted. We also must address the supply by holding traffickers accountable. And we must do what this bill proposes, close off an access point that illicit suppliers have used to meet the demand. Drug Enforcement Administration Administrator Ann Milgram has called social media platform the superhighway of drugs. This description is 100% accurate. Social media is used to facilitate drug transactions. When these drugs contain fentanyl, it could lead to a deadly result. The DEA reports between May and September of 2022, they conducted 390 drug poisoning investigations. Of those, 129 had direct ties to social media. The Orange County Sheriff's Department also investigates drug-related deaths with the intent of identifying the seller for potential prosecution. One of the challenges we face in this work is the unavailability of record with regard to drug transactions. Some of the most prominent social media comp companies only retain records for a 24-hour period. By the time the overdose occurs and law enforcement is called to the scene, it is likely that the 24-hour period from the time of the drug sale has passed. One reason dealers use social media is the ease of access and the ability to make a sale with little to no record of the transaction. AB 1027 attempts to push these companies to a longer retention period, which would be instrumental to bringing drug traffickers to justice. Additionally, AB 955 adds meaningful sentences to the law for those who make the decision to sell fentanyl via social media. These are common sense measures that are an important component towards ending the crisis. Again, I would like to thank the Assemblywoman uh, uh, Petrie Morris for your partnership in keeping our community safe. Good afternoon. I'm Katrina Poli, County Supervisor representing the 5th District. And I'm going to cut to the chase. Uh, this is not a good day. As a mom, as a former school board member, as a community leader, PTA president, um, we are just outraged by the small group of people who are legislators in Sacramento who are preventing reasonable bills that will protect our kids from moving forward. As you heard from the district attorney, Senator Umberg's bill, it was the least we could do. He had the support of 21 members of the Senate and it did not get out of committee on a four to one vote. That's not justice, that's not democracy. It's not about sentencing enhancements either. It was an admonishment. But what it, what it showed is that there is an effort to treat fentanyl like other drug issues in the past. And fentanyl is different. 
More than 110 Californians die every week in this state, in California. The same amount as people who could fit into a Boeing 737. If a plane was crashing every week in California, do you think we would just sit back and do nothing? Of course not, but that is what is happening. Our children and our loved ones are getting murdered. And for me, it's personal. My husband is a teacher and a coach. And at least two of his students have died from fentanyl poisoning. Two Orange Coast College students bought Xanax, now dead. A young woman, 21 years, a twin, bought Oxycontin. It was laced with fentanyl. She's now dead. Their families grieve. But let's talk about also those who aren't buying drugs. Our public safety first responders who are, are going out on calls, our school nurses, our coaches and counselors who are at risk because of the high toxicity of fentanyl with ingesting or even being exposed to it to affect their health. What about the little girl that's in the hospital right now on life support because she got exposed to fentanyl while shopping with her mom? Or the baby who ingested fentanyl while lying in a bed at an Airbnb that her parents rented for a vacation. She was one month old. That vacation won't ever be forgotten. Almost every single day, I hear stories and statistics from our county staff, our district attorney, our local law enforcement, the local community, friends, family, and colleagues. What more will it take for us to get real justice and real solutions. This bill, these two bills that the Assemblywoman is bringing forward are critical because we know that social media is a place where people are targeted, kids are targeted. You see this picture here that I'm sure someone's gonna talk about but I ha can't not notice, it's all colorful like candy. That's intentional so that kids will be attracted to it. But let me be clear, for those who are criticizing those of us who want accountability for drug dealers who are murdering our kids, we are expending enormous amounts of funds on treatment. We believe in treatment. We believe in rehabilitation and recidivism, to prevent recidivism. I sit on the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council. We are working on rehabilitation efforts and programs that are occurring both in the schools, outside the schools, and in juvenile hall. We are spending hundreds of millions on substance abuse treatment efforts, housing for transitional aged youth coming out of juvenile hall, and we have incredibly innovative programs right here in Orange County that we are trying to use to prevent kids from taking drugs and to help those who have become drug addicts. My husband is a teacher. He works for a special program of kids. These kids are at-risk kids. He focuses every day with his team of counselors and supports to help these kids from turning towards a criminal path of drug dealing. So any insinuation that we are not focusing on treatment, on helping people, on, on rehabilitating people is just wrong. And I encourage anyone to come and learn more about what we're doing here in Orange County to help and to prevent drug abuse and to prevent recidivism in our county. As I said, I used to sit on the school board and I was very involved in our PTA and our boosters. Any parent, and I know we're probably going to hear from one here in a minute, um, will tell you that the fact that we have to have Narcan in our schools, in our classrooms, in our nursing offices, and with our coaches so that we can prevent a overdose or a poisoning, that is just unreal. It's unbelievable. 
So we'll continue to do that. At the Board of Supervisors, we have worked to put Narcan in our schools. We are trying to educate our superintendents and all of our school districts to make sure that that is available. On the Orange County Transportation Authority, we're trying to put Narcan on the buses. So we're doing the work of treating and we're doing the work to try to prevent these crimes. But we need the help with the criminal justice system because people have to be held accountable. So thank you, Assemblywoman, for hosting this today and spreading the word. And uh, we must continue to talk about this. We will not stop talking about this issue. We'll continue to talk about it so that every person in Orange County knows one pill can kill. Thank you. Um, and at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Michael Kent from the Irvine Police Department. Chief. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. I'm Irvine Police Chief Michael Kent. As you have heard from many of the speakers today, there's no doubt that fentanyl poses a significant danger to our communities, and the city of Irvine is no different. In 2022, approximately 35% of all calls for service involving overdose in Irvine was a result of fentanyl. This was an increase from 2021, where only 18% of overdose, overdose calls involved this insidious drug. Although the total number of overdose cases in our community is low, one death is far, far too many. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the communities and the family members that are impacted by this awful, awful drug. I know that words cannot change what has happened or bring back these loved ones, but please know that the Irvine Police Department, along with other law enforcement ag agencies in Orange County will collectively work to continue and stay committed to preventing another family from having to experience this tragedy. Anytime a member of the community experiences an overdose or we suspect the sale of an illegal narcotic that is occurring within our city, we aggressively investigate to determine the source. Our special investigations unit investigates community tips and conducts follow-up with narcotic-related arrests. We've been successful in our investigations and we've arrested numerous individuals for the sales of narcotics, but specifically for the sales of fentanyl. But that's not enough. We need to do more. While we do everything we can to get fentanyl and other dangerous drugs off our streets, we do need help from our legislators. I would like to publicly thank Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris, not just for her support of the Irvine Police Department, but her overall support for the law enforcement professional profession. I specifically want to thank her for sponsoring AB 955 and AB 1027. We also need to speak in a unified voice about the dangers of fentanyl. That is why I'm 100% supportive of the One Pill Can Kill Awareness campaign. And you can count on the Irvine Police Department to amplify that message on our social media platforms and our department website. I truly believe that together we can end this crisis and make our communities safer. I will now pass it to my partner, Costa Mesa Police Chief Lawrence. Thank you, Chief Kent. My name is Ron Lawrence, I'm the police chief in Costa Mesa, and I'm fortunate to be here and join Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris in this uh, very important topic. You've heard at the state level some of the challenges and issues you've heard from our county board of supervisor, Katrina Foley, uh, her support of, of our efforts here in combating fentanyl. Uh, and I want to bring it down to the local level with, with my colleague, Chief Kent, because it's our officers who are dealing with this on the streets. It's our officers who are interfacing with the families in these tragic moments, and we're dealing with that strong reality. And I'll share with you some numbers from our local community in Costa Mesa. We're a safe, small city, we're 110, 115,000 people, and the numbers I want to share with you are hometown USA. They're your community. They're our community. This, this dangerous drug permeates throughout every community in our state, 
and nobody is immune to this. So as I read these numbers, think about your own hometown. Think about your own local city. Think about your city council and your mayor. I'm fortunate in Costa Mesa. I've got a great mayor, John Stevens, who I'm about to introduce. Our city council supports us. Our supervisor, Katrina Foley, our assemblywoman. We've got this alignment with our district attorney. When we're all on the same page with an issue, that should have a loud and resounding voice to our legislators on this topic. In 2021 in Costa Mesa, Costa Mesa, we had 204 fentanyl poisonings. That's an average of 17 a month in my little city. In 2022, we had 171 fentanyl poisonings, an average of 14 a month. Over those two years, it's an average of four deaths per month we experienced in my little town. And that is, it, it, those are numbers that are the similar or even worse in some other communities in your hometown. Many of these deaths are a result of individual and drug dealers furnishing counterfeit pills or other illegal narcotics containing illicit fentanyl to unsuspecting people who are unaware of their presence. Now, law enforcement's taken very, uh, a lot of proactive measures to combat this, but more can be done, and we need the help of our legislators in Sacramento and your local community. I would challenge you to ask your, your mayor and your city council, where are they at on this issue, and where are they at in supporting Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris on uh, combating fentanyl? Between 2018 and 2023, our Costa Mesa Police Department seized 283 pounds of fentanyl and over 522,000 laced fentanyl, uh, fentanyl pills. These came from out of our city, and I'm, I'm proud of our police officers for getting these dangerous drugs off the streets because they literally saved lives by doing that. We're successful at obtaining indictments against subjects who have been identified as furnishing fentanyl to victims who died as an overdose and poisoning of fentanyl. And Cotty Petrie Norris's uh, uh, legislation around uh, social media is absolutely spot on. This is a gateway. This is how people interact with our citizens that are unsuspecting, and they, they lure our children and our, our people who are addicted to drugs into this unsuspecting fentanyl crisis. And like other law enforcement agencies throughout Orange County, we actually give an advisement to people that are furnishing uh, or distributing fentanyl, that if they know that they should know that if it causes the death of another person, that they can be charged with homicide. Our, we've worked closely with our district attorney on that very issue. We've worked closely with our federal partners on that very issue. We've had uh, a few indictments and successful cases at uh, pursuing homicide charges. Now, the Costa Mesa Police Department strongly supports legislation, any legislation, that will positively assist us in reducing the sale and distribution of illegal fentanyl and prevent fentanyl-related crises. It's in your community. It's in my community. We must do more to, to support this. And one thing we work closely with our, our DEA and our county uh, uh, leaders is the public awareness campaign of One Pill Can Kill. Because the truth is, the more we talk about this, the more you get out and talk to your city council or your mayor, or you get to talk to your assemblywoman or your uh, board of supervisor and, and ask them where they stand on this issue, the more that conversation permeates, the better we'll all be and we can, can, uh, can get this crisis under efforts. And I mentioned I'm proud to have the support of our mayor and our city council, and that's true. And Costa Mesa is a, a model example. When we align on these issues and we can combat this together, we are so much stronger. And it's my honor to introduce our mayor of Costa Mesa, John Stevens. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, sit, standing over here and listening to the speakers, it's, it struck me in a couple of ways. Number one, I've learned so much, and I hope that you and the media have taken all these facts and figures, and you're going to include those in your, uh, in your reports and in your stories. I'm also struck with a tremendous amount of pride, pride to be associated with uh, Cotty Petrie Norris and what she's trying to do to address this issue. I, it's, it's a great amount of sadness that she's having friction up in Sacramento, and I want to pledge to her and to everybody in the state of California and the great city of Costa Mesa that we at the city council will do everything we can to support her. I'm proud of our district attorney, Todd Spitzer, for the work that he's doing. And at the local level, all, and all of our law enforcement, at the local level, Chief Lawrence, so proud of the work that he's doing. And you know, I remember when he first became our chief. It was in September of 2021. And you heard some of the statistics about how that was a pivotal time with respect to uh, the fentanyl crisis, and it's gotten even worse. However, in the city of Costa Mesa, uh, Chief Lawrence, when I said to him, I go, what do you see in the city? What do you see? You've now been here for a few months. He goes, too many people are dying because of drugs in the city of Costa Mesa. And so he made it a, a high, high priority of the city of Costa Mesa's police department. 
And I'm so proud that he did. And he, he explained to you and laid out all of the things that they've done. And really, in the city of Costa Mesa, we've substantially we've taken a lot of pills off the market. We've gotten rid of a lot of dr drug dealers. And this, as uh, our, uh, our former mayor, my dear friend Katrina Foley, our supervisor, said, this is not an overdose. This is not about an overdose. This is poisoning by people who are dealing these drugs on social media and murdering our children. We have to do more about it, and I'm pledged I pledge as the mayor and on behalf of the council to do what we can to address this issue. And now I'd like to call up Carol Green from president of the California State PTA. Thank you. Um, after going after all of the um, law enforcement and the people that have all the statistics, what I'd like to do is put a face to some of those statistics and let you know that the um, more than 500,000 members of the California State PTA, very strongly, parents and teachers want to know what is going on with the fentanyl crisis. They want to be educated. They want to support um, reversal drugs. And they want there to be more education and more advocacy. I know we're going to hear about an individual um, bit of information, but we just recently had our California State PTA convention in which we had a workshop about this crisis, about the um, opportunities for parents to learn more, and so many people came up to me afterwards and said, did you know? And it is still evolving that parents are realizing that this is a crisis. The thing I want to tell you is that it's not somebody else's kids. It's your kids. And I would never wish this upon anyone. So I wouldn't want the lawmakers and the people that are making decisions to have to experience this personally. But just know you could, and you very well might. A colleague of mine, just after we had um, adopted a position statement on, um, we call it overdose reversal drugs, um, she called me up and let me know that as a member of her school board, they had given out Narcan that night. And she went home and heard some strange noises coming from the bathroom downstairs. She went down to see her son, 22-year-old, making gasping noises and didn't know what was going on. She had been at her school board meeting that night and been given Narcan. She dug through her backpack and gave her son the Narcan, and he is alive today because of that. This is not somebody else's kid. This is your child, this is my child, and they're all our children. And we have to do whatever it is we can to keep them from being killed, to keep them from being poisoned by predators. Please, educate yourselves and your community and do the advocacy work we need to make sure all of our children can be safe. Thank you. Uh, and I'd now like to uh, welcome Abra Ronquillo, who is joining us from the Alexander Neville Foundation. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abra. I represent the Alexander Neville Foundation. Uh, we, have, we support these legislative efforts today because they're necessary. Drug dealers are known, knowingly distributing fentanyl and killing people, while social media companies like Snapchat enable them. When Alexander died, it was like a bomb went off in our lives. Those who survived the explosion lost a part of their soul, while others were simply shattered by the premature loss of a promising young person. We were shattered by heartbreak of losing family and friends, but also by the knowledge that this was even happening. Until I learned Alex was gone, I didn't know about fentanyl. Um, his parents didn't know about fentanyl. Uh, in fact, Alex didn't know about fentanyl. And that knowledge has transformed our lives we now recognize that other children have and will succumb to fentanyl again. It's a haunting specter in all schools and all neighborhoods now. Despite this knowledge getting into the mainstream, many young people will continue to exper experiment or self-medicate. Many will not connect the dots or recognize that all black market pills are fake. Those who are ignorant in this are especially vulnerable. So the community needs to spread awareness. Holding dealers accountable for their destruction is another good step for our youth, our greatest impact will be from education. 
from them holding social media like Snapchat accountable for what takes place on their platforms. No 14-year-old should be able to order illicit drugs and have them delivered more easily than a pizza. While these platforms finally close down those open-air drug markets, they, were out and they will come out and unharmed on social media while continuing to thrive. But while we wait for them to take action, thousands upon thousands of young lives will become lost in the process. And I just want to commend Amy. She couldn't be here today, so hopefully I did her justice. But she's out there saving your children. It's too late for hers. It's, there's nothing she can do to bring him back. But instead of cowering, instead of hiding, she's out there fighting for all of you and your kids every day. And um, I'd just like to thank her for that. And thank you guys for your time today. Thank you, Abra, and uh, thank you again to um, everyone who has been here today uh, for your partnership and leadership in this fight. And um, alongside the legislative efforts that we are pushing in Sacramento, we also recognize just how critical it is that we increase education and awareness for, for parents, for kids, for everyone in the state of California. And uh, my team and I are spearheading the rollout of our statewide uh, awareness campaign, leveraging the DEA's One Pill Can Kill campaign. Uh, and I think as part of that, I really want moms and dads and gra grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and in anyone who's listening today, I think to, to walk away with kind of two calls to action. And the first is related, is related to Narcan. And like Supervisor Foley, I wish we didn't live in a world where this was the case, but we live, in, we live in reality, and every house, every house should have this. Every school and classroom certainly should have this, and we're working on that. And I actually want people to know that I think this is easier to get than people realize. So Narcan is available over the counter. Uh, if you have insurance, including Medi-Cal, it is covered by insurance. You can walk into your local pharmacy and ask for Narcan this afternoon. So I know that's where I got this, and um, every every parent and every kid in California needs to know how to use this. Um, and then second is a call to action to parents, to parents who are as horrified as I am that we live in a world where we all need to have Narcan. We need your voices. We need you to reach out to your legislators and let them know that this is a priority. Let them know that you are paying attention and that you expect them to act. There is no doubt that the fentanyl epidemic is an urgent public health crisis. And there is also no doubt that we must act with urgency. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna say a big thank you, um, Aubrey, to you for being here to Amy Neville, Alexander's mom, and to all of the parent advocates who have supported my bill, who are, we're working with, who come to Sacramento to testify, uh, and who have transformed the ultimate loss and the ultimate tragedy into advocacy to keep my kids safe and to keep your kids safe. I wanna say thank you for your bravery, uh, and thank you for everything that you are doing for California. And I also just wanna commit that we are not gonna let you down. We are going to stand beside you in this fight, and we are going to ensure that we do everything possible to keep California kids safe. Uh, so thank you again for being here today, and uh, with that, Happy to open up for any questions that you may have.
Um, well, and thank you. Thank you for that question. So uh, on Thursday, so yesterday, uh, the Assembly's Public Safety Committee convened a special hearing focused on a number of bill proposals to combat the fentanyl crisis that followed a, a Tuesday hearing in the Senate Public Safety Committee. And uh, a number of bills did advance from yesterday's hearing, uh, bills that are focused on education, on increasing the supply of life-saving drugs, uh, creating a task force to bring folks together to develop comprehensive solutions. However, uh, bills, all of the bills that were focused on increasing criminal penalties or adding additional enhancements for the sales and trafficking of this deadly poison did not advance from that committee. And uh, the, the reality is that my colleagues who oppose proposals to strengthen criminal, criminal penalties point back to our failed war on drugs and equivocate the work that we were trying to do in response to the fentanyl crisis to that. And I think we've learned a lot from the war on drugs. And I will say that the proposals that I am working on, the, the bills that my colleagues and I are trying to advance, we are not trying to criminalize folks who are purchasing fentanyl, folks who might be addicts or users. We recognize that addicts and users need treatment and rehabilitation. And as Supervisor Foley shared, at every level, we are investing in treatment and rehabilitation. However, alongside that, we need to strengthen penalties so that, and this is the governor himself, Governor Newsom himself said last week that we need to hold accountable these poison peddlers who are killing our kids. And that's the bottom line. There needs to be accountability and there needs to be consequences for murdering our children, bottom line. And I think the other point that I would make, uh, and, and it's, it's, Supervisor Foley made the same point, fentanyl is different. Fentanyl is different and our approach to fentanyl needs to be different. These are not accidental, by and large, these are not accidental overdoses where someone did too much heroin, too much meth, too much cocaine. This is poison. If I was sitting in a bar and ordered a cocktail and somebody put cyanide in it, nobody would be talking about the fact that I accidentally overdosed. I was murdered. I was, I, that's a murder. And what is happening now is poison and it's murder. And we need to treat it that way. So um, let me do a little criminal law quick, uh, you know, thumbnail. <clears throat> All right. So under state law, in order to prove murder, we, we have to prove that the individual who sold the drugs had a specific mental state. We have to prove that they had the, what we call the mens rea, uh, the malice of forethought uh, involved for a murder. You can imply that malice through knowledge. So the reason these admonishments are so critical and the one under SB 44, we are trying to codify in state law because as you heard, uh, the police officers in almost every agency in Orange County, including the Sheriff's Department, are giving an admonishment when they arrest a drug dealer. That is potentially admissible in court, but it's subject to the judge's discretion whether to let that in. When my prosecutors are getting guilty pleas in court, we are requesting the court allow us to read the admonishment again, or maybe sometimes for the first time. But I have sad news to report. A large number of Orange County Superior Court judges are not letting us read the admonishment in court. And as a result of that, in some cases with those we convict of selling drugs, where there wasn't a death, 
we have admonishments. In other cases, we do not. We oftentimes have it with the police. Sometimes we don't. The analogy, and people are very familiar with it now, is under the driving under the influence of alcohol, we call it a Watson advisement, that's the name of the case, where an individual, and in Watson, they didn't have a prior conviction, but I digress a little bit. The point being is, in court today, if you're convicted of driving under the influence, you are told, if you drive under the influence again at a future event and you kill somebody, you can be charged with murder. And so that prior conviction is admissible in a subsequent trial for DUI where people die to show the jury, the trier of fact, that the person knew and has been told that driving under the influence is dangerous and could result in death where they could be held accountable for murder. That's the implied malice. We're trying to do the exact same thing in the state legislature in the area of those who deal drugs. What is so sad to me is when we observed that hearing with Senator Umberg, he repeatedly took amendments that were asked by Senator Skinner and Senator Bradford and others. He was willing to water down the bill to get something. And after agreeing to those amendments, and she knows and I know having presented bills in that body, when you agree to amendments, it's a gentleman's handshake that if you agree to amendments, they will vote for your bill. He took the amendments and they still laid off the bill. And that's why I think Senator Umberg's comments were so stringent and harsh, because when you make a deal, you expect people to live. Now, let me contrast that with the feds. The feds don't require a mental state. All you have to prove is the person sold an illicit drug, oxycodone, which is what Alex died from, or some other illicit street drug, or Valium or Xanax. That the person took that substance and that the coroner then ties as a result of taking that substance, there was fentanyl in there and the person succumbed to that taking of the drug um, as a result of ingesting that substance. There's no requirement in the federal courts to prove that the dealer knew that the substance contained fentanyl. That is an element of the crime we have to prove in state court, but they don't have to prove in federal court, which is why I've done a runaround to federal court in order to avoid the thing we're trying to close the loophole in Sacramento through the work of our good uh, assemblywoman and through Senator Umberg's bill. It was tried several years ago by former Senator Melissa Melendez, it failed. So my point being is we need an admonishment to prove the mental state of implied malice under state law. And I know that's extremely wonky, but you all cover the courts and you know that our prosecutors have to prove every element of the crime. We don't get to pick and choose every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. And implied malice is an element of the crime in state court. And that's the loophole we're trying to close. Thank you. Crazy easy to do. I hope I simplified. You did. Yes, you did. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you again for being here. And I think as, uh, as, as one of our speakers noted, when awareness and education is so important, I want to thank the media for continuing to shine a spotlight on this. And I hope, I hope that the conversations we've had today trigger just one, one parent, one mom, to talk to, to their kids about the dangers of fentanyl and uh, to educate them that one pill can kill. Thank you.